I just did a five channel AVR buying guide video last week. There were just a little bit more than a handful to choose from because five channel AVRs aren't the most popular right now in 2023, but I did at least give you my recommendations. But between five channel and seven channel, it's a big difference. So we're gonna go over seven channel AVRs that are available right now in 2023, but I'm not gonna go over each one like I did in the previous video. I'm just gonna go straight to my suggestions, my recommendations, and just kind of give you like a this or that, or choose this over that because of this kind of thing. So strap in, let's get this done. Seven channel AVRs this time, boom. Before we get started officially on this video, I do wanna quickly go over the entire list of seven channel AVRs that I made, uh, listing them from lowest price to highest price. Honestly, just because you might be interested in some of the ones that I gloss over because there's just too many to choose from. And just a disclaimer, these are all the most recent versions of these seven channel AVRs that are available. There are a few that I will spotlight that do have predecessors that are still available in 2023 and might be a valuable option for you. So I'll show you what I mean later on. So without further ado, here is my list of the newest versions of seven channel AVRs available in 2023. <gasps> Sony STR-DH790, Denon AVR S770H, Denon AVR X1800H, Onkyo TX-NR6100, Pioneer VSX LX105, Yamaha RX-V6A, Sony STR-AN1000, Denon AVR S970H, Yamaha Avantage RX A2A, Sony STR AZ 1000 ES, Denon AVR X 2800H, Marantz Cinema 70S, Yamaha Avantage RX A4A, NAD T758 V3I, Marantz Cinema 60, Arkham AVR 5, Arkham AVR 11, Anthem MRX 748K. Woo! Did you get all that? Okay, let's hop online and I'm gonna give you my recommendations and maybe a little bit more details on certain AVRs. The Sony STR-DH790 is still the cheapest seven channel AVR you can buy. And it's been around since 2018, folks. Five years, holy cow. But I mean, it's still the one I recommend the most when it comes to just ultra budget, options when you're wanting to get into Dolby Atmos or DTSX for the first time. Maybe you're tired of your crappy TV speakers or crappy soundbar and you wanna jump straight into Dolby Atmos, I always recommend this one first. Right now, as you can see, it's on sale for $348, but it's normally $448. But my goodness, seven channels where you can create a 5.1.2 Dolby Atmos configuration for only $348, that is a steal, my friends. Although there's a reason it is so cheap. And one of those reasons is it has these ridiculous spring-loaded binding posts. I cannot stand spring-loaded binding posts. They still work, they still do the job, but I prefer these. These are five-way binding posts, which you will find on pretty much every other AVR that we're gonna go over today. But just wanted to throw that out there. There's a reason it's one of the cheapest AVRs out there. But if you're on a really, really tight budget, it still does the job. It's got 90 watts per channel, Although that's into six ohms, it says. A lot of consumer grade speakers are eight ohm nominal. So the fact that the watts per channel is based on six ohms, eh, that tells me it's probably more like 75 watts per channel when dealing with an eight ohm load. And again, just so you're aware, that means two channels driven. So if you're powering all seven channels at the same time and you've got eight ohm nominal speakers, which is typical, you're probably only gonna get maybe 50 watts per channel when all seven are firing at once, just so you know. Since it is one of the cheapest models on the market today, it does not have the latest HDMI protocols like HDMI 2.1, it has HDMI 2.0a and HTCP 2.2. So that is a little outdated at this point in 2023, so just be aware of that. But it does still mean that it supports 4K HDR video. And honestly, that's going to suffice for the majority of you out there, especially if you're just getting into home theater or wanting to expand your home theater and make it better. It supports all the major HDR formats except for HDR10+, which is 
Samsung's proprietary HDR format. For you vinyl record enthusiasts, it does not have a phono input, so you will have to have a phono preamp if you want to connect your turntable to this. But yeah, that's really the only thing I want to go over for this particular one because it is the cheapest option out there, still in 2023. Okay, one thing I want to touch on is I want to go over the different versions of Denon 7-channel AVRs that are available. As you can see, I have this comparison of the Denon AVR S770H, S970H, X1800H, and X2800H. As you can see from this comparison page, the price is always lower when you're going to be dealing with the S chip with any Denon AVR. That is Denon's budget processing chip. So it does a pretty good job with channel separation. It does a pretty good job processing Dolby Atmos and DTSX immersive audio. But honestly, given the option, I would still go for the X chip if possible. In fact, as you can see, the X1800H is less than the S970H. There are a couple of bells and whistles that the 1800H doesn't have when compared to the 970H, but I would still get the 1800H over the S970H, again, because it has the better X chip inside. But if you're still sticking to a very tight budget, the S770H is still a very good option. You're still going to get great surround sound. You're still going to get Dolby Atmos and DTSX processing. But if $649 is still a bit too much for you, it's not available on crutchfield.com. But as you can see here, the predecessor, the S760H, is still available. And at least while I record this, this is $369, normally $447. Uh, but $369, that's almost $300 less than the newer version, the 770H. So again, still highly capable. You still get Dolby Atmos. You still get 8K video support, unlike the Sony STR-DH790. You've got HDMI 2.1. You've got next-gen gaming features like variable refresh rate and auto low latency mode. So yeah, this is again, a very viable option if you're sticking to a very tight budget. I would honestly go with this, the 760H, over the Sony STR-DH790. But if the X chip is really what you're striving for because you know it is the better chip compared to the S and the X chip, the difference between the 1800H and the 2800H is just a few bells and whistles. For example, as you can see here, the 1800H has 80 watts of power, whereas the 2800H has 95 watts of power. So a little bit more power, one more set of audio only inputs. The 2800H has two HDMI outputs instead of just one, but most people only need one anyway. All right, another one I wanna highlight is Onkyo TXNR6100 for $799. It's got a little bit more power with 100 watts per channel into eight ohms, Dolby Atmos and DTSX support, but also THX certified select. So if THX certification is something you're striving for and want in your home theater, you should probably go with Onkyo. Supports HDMI 2.1, 8K 60Hz and 4K 120Hz video support, HDCP 2.3 for copyright protection, supports all the major HDR formats, ARC and eARC. Another thing I want to mention is that Pioneer, Onkyo, and Integra are all under the same umbrella. They have the same parent company. Onkyo is geared towards home theater applications, although it still plays music just fine. But having said that, Pioneer tends to be the more hybrid of the two, meaning it does home theater well, but it also leans a little bit more musical than the Onkyo counterpart. So if you're one that likes to listen to music a lot through your home theater system and you're gravitating towards Onkyo, Pioneer, Integra, then Pioneer might be the one that you go with. And finally, Integra is more geared towards home integration. So if you're big on smart homes and everything being controlled via your smartphone or tablet, you've got cameras all over the place, you've got whole home audio, music that can play in every room, that kind of whole home integration. Um, I mean, that's why it's called Integra because it is integrated into your home more easily. It just has some features that are made for home integration. So if that's your jam, then you might want to get the Integra equivalent. 
Although, to be honest, Integra doesn't actually have a seven channel AVR. I guess because they're more geared towards home integration, they're either five channel or nine channel and beyond. So for whatever reason, they just kind of skipped over the seven channel AVR market. Okay, also for you home theater and music enthusiasts, Yamaha might be something you're gonna want to gravitate towards because just like Pioneer, Yamaha does have a lot of features geared towards music playing, as well as features to enhance your music to make it sound better. For example, Yamaha receivers have Music Cast, which wirelessly connects compatible Yamaha components together for seamless whole home audio. So again, if you are a fan of having speakers all over your house, being able to play music and have it controlled by one particular AVR, Yamaha might be something that you want. Okay, so if Yamaha sounds enticing to you, let's go over some of the Yamaha options that I had in this list, namely the V6A, A2A, and A4A. Kind of like Denon with its S and X chips, Yamaha kind of has a similar thing because they have the V chip and the A chip. And obviously by the price point, you can see that the A chip is just a little bit better, processes the audio more efficiently. The V6A and the A2A are very similar. I mean, they're both rated at 100 watts, two channels driven. So yes, currently the V6A is on sale for $649, which is a great deal, but it is the inferior chipset, the V chip, so if you can spend a little bit more, I would honestly try to go for the A chip. And comparing the A2A and the A4A, since the A4A is currently on sale for $12.99, I would probably go for that one. But depending on when you're watching this, this may no longer be on sale. So if that's the case, I would go with the A2A because the A4A just has a little bit more bells and whistles and a tiny bit more power, you know, 110 watts, two channels driven as opposed to 100 watts. Eh, that's not that big of a difference. So yeah, if you love to listen to music just as much as you like watching movies and TV shows in your living room, I would maybe lean towards Yamaha. And if possible, I would get the A chip, not the V chip. But if you're still sticking to a very tight budget, the V6A is still highly capable of giving you an incredible immersive audio experience and a better whole home audio experience, being able to cast music uh, pretty effortlessly to your entire home if you have compatible devices in various rooms. All right, let's put a spotlight on Sony for a minute. Yes, the STR-DH790 is the cheapest on the market right now, but the more expensive version with more bells and whistles used to be the DN1080, which you can find on Amazon still, but as you can see here, all the buying options are used products, not brand new anymore. And since it's a few years old, it's not exactly future-proof. It only supports 4K HDR, not 8K, not HDMI 2.1. So it's not the best for you hardcore gamers out there, but if you're just gonna use it for watching movies and TV shows, this is definitely a, a good option if you don't mind getting a used product. But going back to the AN1000, that is the successor to the DN1080. And at least while recording this, this is on a fantastic sale. Only $5.99, holy cow. It's normally $8.99. But one really cool thing about this particular AVR that I wanna point out is that it has right and left front pre-outs. So if you have some really nice tower speakers or bookshelf speakers that can handle a lot of power and you have a two channel external amp, you can connect that external amp into this left and right pre-out section, which would also make music listening that much better since music typically just comes out of your front left and right because it's stereo. Again, this must just be a Sony thing, but 100 watts per channel into six ohms. Again, eight ohms is your typical consumer grade speaker. 100 watts into six ohms would probably translate to more like 75 or 80 watts into eight ohms. Not only does it support DTSX and Dolby Atmos, but it also supports IMAX Enhanced, which is IMAX's own proprietary immersive audio format. Another really cool thing about this AVR is that it has the Digital Cinema Auto Calibration 9, which is Sony's auto room calibration software, but also 360 spatial sound mapping. The combination of their proprietary room correction software and 360 spatial sound mapping, which is what I got to experience when I reviewed the Sony AZ-3000ES. Apart from Dirac Live, 
the combination of those two room correction algorithms is incredible. Incredible channel separation, creating incredible space within the speakers. So yeah, with this being on sale for $599, man, this is a good deal. And also because it's one of the newer AVRs that Sony has put out, it is now compatible with Sony's wireless speakers and subwoofers. As you can see here, like the SARS-3S, SARS-5 wireless speakers, and the SW3 and SW5 wireless subwoofers. So that's really cool if you want to not have to worry about as much speaker wire. I just think that's one of the coolest things that Sony has implemented in their latest AVRs. And since it's Sony, uh, obviously it's HDMI 2.1 compatible, 4K 120 Hertz compatible for next gen gaming, variable refresh rate, auto low latency mode. It makes sense, especially if you own a PS5. But speaking of the two Sony models in my list for seven channel AVRs, they are almost identical, but just like Denon chipsets and Yamaha chipsets, the AN chip is going to be inferior to the AZ chip. So the capabilities in the AZ-1000ES are just a little bit more refined, a little bit more sophisticated, but if you're sticking to a tighter budget, the AN-1000 is still very capable, especially if it's on sale for $599 like it is now. All right, let's talk about Marantz for a minute. In this list, I had the Marantz Cinema 70S and Cinema 60, $1,200 and $1,700 respectively. As you can see here, the S in 70S stands for slimline because it is the more slim, lower profile AVR between the two. The Cinema 60 is more powerful, at least regarding the internal amps. The 70S is rated at 50 watts per channel, two channels driven, and the Cinema 60 is rated at 100 watts per channel, two channels driven. But other than that, they are very similar. I mean, the Cinema 60 has two optical digital inputs instead of one, as well as two coax inputs instead of one. If you need more than one, I guess you can go for the Cinema 60, but I imagine most people will only need one or maybe none because optical is kind of on its way out and becoming obsolete. The Cinema 60 has two HDMI outputs, whereas the 70S has one HDMI output. But again, most people only need one. They have all the latest modern features like HDMI 2.1, 8K60 and 4K 120 support, next gen gaming features. But here's where the Cinema 70S and the Cinema 60 stand apart from every other seven channel AVR out there that we've talked about so far. And it's on the back, right here, a full set of pre-outs. So far, it's either been just subwoofers or just subwoofers and front left and right that are within the preamp section. But these two seven channel cinema AVRs from Marantz have a full set of preouts, so you can potentially power every single one of your speakers in your system externally. You don't need to rely on the internal amps to power your speakers. Maybe you've got a seven channel amp or maybe a combination of a couple amps adding up to seven because you've got some real nice speakers that can handle a lot of power. Maybe you're wanting to build up to a preamp instead of using like an all-in-one AVR. So this is a good stepping stone so you could get the 70S, start building up your collection of external amps, and then one day eventually get a preamp. But we all know most preamps are very expensive. So this is at least one semi-budget way to eventually get into more powerful speakers and preamps. And truth be told, this is what I currently have in my living room right now for that very fact that it has pre-outs for every single channel. I also like the slim profile better than the Cinema 60, which is a little bit taller. So I can fit a couple more things in the cabinet than I could if I had the Cinema 60. But just a big heads up, I will soon be getting a speaker system that I believe, at least on paper, to be my end game, modern, open concept living room system. And these speakers can handle a lot of power. So I need something like the Marantz Cinema 70S so then I can use external amps exclusively to power these extremely cool speakers. So I don't wanna give away too much information right now because you'll definitely see that video in the future. I'm very excited about this. So be on the lookout for that. 
But if you're like me and you prefer external amps to power your speakers, go for the Cinema 70S, save some money, so then you can maybe get a Basics A3 from Emotiva or a Basics A5 or A7, whatever. Because the fact that the Cinema 60 is more powerful with the internal amps, that doesn't matter for me. So that's why I think the Cinema 70S is one of the coolest, most overlooked AVRs on the market today. All right, this next set of AVRs I want to spotlight comes with a huge asterisk. And as you can see, these are all AVRs from Arcam. Or is it Arkham? Batman? Arkham? I don't know. And as you can see, they are all on a really good sale right now, if this is enticing to you, which is what I'm about to tell you. The reason I have an asterisk next to these is because, yes, they are technically 7.2 channel home theater receivers, but if we look a little bit closer to the AVR5, for example, look at this. It's got seven internal amps, but this AVR can process a total of 11 channels plus two subwoofers. So you can have a 7.2.4 Dolby Atmos or DTSX immersive audio configuration, which is the end game configuration for most of you out there. But as you can see in this little section here, this is the preamp section, front left, front right, surround left, surround right, center, surround back left, surround back right, sub one, sub two, height one, height two. But since there's only seven internal amps, you have to have external amps to power the rest of those speakers if you want to have a 7.2.4 configuration. So this is a class of AVR that I would call a hybrid because it is an AVR and a preamp kind of all in one. Okay, doing a little more research, I did find out that one of the biggest differences is that the AVR10 is a couple years older than the AVR5. The AVR5 is now considered the entry level AVR, but the AVR10 has direct live room correction built in, which is a huge plus. Whereas the AVR5 is direct live ready. It doesn't actually come with it. You have to purchase it separately. But other than that, I mean, it looks like they have the same DAC inside. So between the AVR5 and AVR10, I would go with the AVR5, especially right now, 1690. That's a really good deal. Especially if you have enough external amps already to support a 7.2.4 configuration. But if you've got the money to spend and you want better future proofing with 8K video support, HDMI 2.1, all that stuff, then yes, I would recommend the AVR11, especially when it's $610 off like it is now. And lastly, continuing with the asterisk category, the Anthem MRX 748K. Again, technically a 7.2 channel AVR, but just like the RCAM, this can support a 7.2.4 configuration. So if you like the Anthem sound, if you prefer to have an audiophile grade 32-bit 768 kilohertz DAC, if you want not only Dolby Atmos and DTSX, but also IMAX enhanced, maybe you like having a Zone 2 as well as a Zone 2 HDMI output, and you've got a lot of money to spend, <laughs> then sure, go for the MRX 748K. So just to recap, for the most budget conscious consumers out there, yes, the Sony STR-DH790 is the cheapest you can buy, but at least right now, while it's on sale, I would recommend the Denon S760H, because at least while I record this, it's only $20 more, and it has way more updated features, and it has a full set of five-way binding posts, not those silly little spring-loaded binding posts. But if you have it in your budget to spend a little bit more on more power and better features, at least on sale for $599, I would recommend the Sony AN1000. A close second would be the Onkyo TX NR6100, especially if you're trying to stay under $1,000, for example. If you want good home theater and whole home music listening, Yamaha is probably right for you. The V6A is very capable in its own right, but you probably want to go for the A chip if you can. And if you happen to find the RX A4A on sale, like it is now, even during the holiday shopping season, I would probably try and go for that if you can. But the RX A2A is still a very good option. If you want that stepping stone to owning a preamp eventually down the road, and you want to be cool like me, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, then yes, I would highly recommend the Marantz Cinema 70S. 
the coolest seven channel AVR on the market today. And lastly, if you've got some money to spend and you don't have any external amps, but you wanna start to get into external amps, slowly building up a collection of them, I would suggest getting the Arcam AVR5. So you can use the internal amps as long as you need them. And then eventually you can build out a 7.2.4 system without having to get a new AVR. And there you have it. Those are my recommendations. All right, folks, I hope that helped. I hope it helped kind of narrow down your choices or at least help speed up your decision-making process in finding your go-to seven-channel AVR. So good luck with your upcoming holiday shopping. Knowledge is power, so I hope that now you're more equipped to making a better decision on which AVR is perfect for your living room or dedicated home theater room, who knows? Because let's face it, not everybody is flocking to the movie theaters anymore, but we all deserve a fantastic audio experience at home. So good luck and happy shopping. As always, please be kind to each other out there. Don't just watch TV and movies, experience them with a seven channel AVR. And of course, always be listening.